Looking for a way to keep your kids safer online? Traditional monitoring tools can be time consuming and can invade kids' privacy and trust. It's a huge pain for you, and let's face it, kids don't like it. Thankfully, there's a better way. Introducing Bark, the internet safety solution that parents trust and children like. Bark saves you from manually monitoring your child's activities, respecting your time and your child's privacy by only servicing potential concerns. Bark's affordable, award-winning service proactively monitors text messages, emails, and 24 different social media networks for potential safety concerns such as cyberbullying, internet predators, depression, self-harm, suicidal thoughts, sexting, or other inappropriate content so busy parents can save time and gain peace of mind. Plus, with Bark's screen time and web filtering feature, you can manage when your kids can access the internet and which sites are appropriate for them to visit. Listeners can try Bark for free for 30 days at ftnd.org forward slash Bark. That's ftnd.org forward slash Bark. Start protecting your family today with Bark, the smart way to keep kids safer online. My name is Garrett Johnson, and you're listening to Consider Before Consuming, a podcast by Fight the New Drug. And in case you're new here, Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science facts and personal accounts. We want these conversations to be educational, uplifting, and hopeful as we sit down with experts, influencers, activists, and people with personal accounts. We cover a wide variety of topics that may be triggering to some. You can refer to the episode notes for a specific trigger warning. Listener discretion is advised. Today's episode is with Joe Robertson. She is a sex therapist and betrayal trauma specialist who researches pornography. During this conversation, we talk about her TED Talk, why it's important to have open and ongoing conversations about pornography in your home, and so much more. With that being said, let's jump into the conversation. We hope you enjoy this episode of Consider Before Consuming. We want to welcome to the podcast, Joe Robertson. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's so good to be here. Well, in New Zealand, but talking to you. I first heard of you from Richie Hardcore. Uh, he recommended your TED Talk. He, he said that it was his favorite TED Talk on this topic. So I had to go watch your TED Talk, of course. And at the time of recording this conversation, your TED Talk has over 250,000 views. And that's a pretty big deal. (laughs) As I watched your TED Talk, I love your enthusiasm, your professionalism. Oh, Um, thank you. Your enthusiasm is contagious. Oh, (laughs) Oh, that was a very intense talk. (laughs) <laughs> that was a really um, unique experience. Yeah, absolutely. I can imagine. By the way, before we talk more about your TED Talk, I just want to notify our audience that we've linked the TED Talk in the episode notes. So hopefully our audience can drive that number from about 250,000. Let's get it up to like half a million views. <laughs> Um, I've probably watched your TED Talk a thousand times, and despite watching it a thousand times, I can only give it a thumbs up once. So (laughs) how did you end up on that red dot on the TED Talk stage? Yeah, I think um, every... Like every TEDx event, I think works slightly differently, um, but they got in contact with me. I think for years they had actually wanted uh, someone to talk about porn, and hadn't it hadn't quite worked out for a number of reasons and so they found out about me I I, I don't know through someone they knew and then they just contacted me they said hey what do you think you would say and then I gave them you know a one minute spiel on what was off the top of my head and then they said you know would you want to work together and make that happen and so I, I it was it's something that you really have to deliberate on because it's quite a massive commitment right I can imagine it's it's a lot of hours and so fortunately it's part of my job uh, is to do training and therefore it could be incorporated into my wider work but if you yeah it's it's huge it's a huge project and so you can't you definitely can't take it lightly right 
how many hours did you put in in preparation for that TED Talk? Oh, um, I don't know. It's hard to quantify. I think uh, full-time six weeks. Wow. <laughs> Like 40 hours times six. <laughs> That's some dedication. Yeah, I think, I mean, not everybody would do that. I, I mean, yeah, I really invested a lot of time into every detail because there's so much information on porn now. And so you can kind of go in lots of different directions. And I wanted to try and present um, as much information as possible uh, in a really, really effective way. So I deliberated literally on every single word. You mentioned that you had to give a one-minute version of what you would talk about. And I have to ask, what did you say? What, what was the one-minute elevator pitch? Oh, we do a kind of a snapshot of our work as we talk about what porn is at the moment. Like how we, we call it the new porn landscape. And so what is the new landscape? Um, and we don't try and freak anyone out, but we really want adults, particularly parents, to know the truth about porn. So they're not just referencing kind of their own experiences. Um, so we do the new porn landscape. Then we do wider impacts. Uh, and that's gender, risky sex, aggression, mental health and sexual health. Um, then we talk about youth voice. So what are the young people actually saying and what have they requested help with? And then how do you engage in the conversation? So this company that you're referring to, it's a company that you work with or do you own it? Uh, yeah, so it's a not-for-profit or a charity, and we started it probably two and a half years ago now, uh, a, a number of us who worked in different fields, but all kind of engaging in the sexual health field, you know, in slightly different ways and just saw a real gap and particularly in New Zealand. But so we, you know, resources that are tailored to this context, but we saw a gap in terms of who was going to, um, yeah, who was going to engage here, who was going to spark conversation with government or with um, community groups or with the education sector and it was kind of a little bit ad hoc at that point. And so there were organizations doing little parts of that, but we really wanted to kind of have a more united front um, in all of those sectors. So you're one of the founders of this organization. Um, can you talk to some of your other credentials? Yeah. So I, yeah. So I'm a sex therapist and that some people think that sounds a bit creepy. Like <laughs> <laughs> some people think of sex therapists as like people who, you know, would actually help you do things. Right. Uh, and that is not what we do. <laughs> so I did my master's in sex therapy. And uh, basically I work with couples or with women by themselves who are struggling in their sex life. And a significant chunk of my work is around problematic uh, pornography use. So it's impacting their relationship, created some betrayal. Um, but it could be other kind of sexually acting out behaviors um, or just you know, this sounds, this sounds bad, but kind of your run of the mill, like struggling with orgasms and climax and right. struggling with communication around sex. And so, yeah, I do a bit of work in all of those spaces. Thanks for sharing uh, your credentials with us. I think it's important to get those. Um, I want to jump back to something that you said earlier regarding getting caregivers and children on the same page. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, I think there's this massive discrepancy between what young people are engaging with and the struggles that they're having around pornography um, and then what adults think porn is and therefore don't engage. So they reflect back on Playboy or, you know, kind of what we call narrative porn, which is like a 30 minute scene, which, you know, has character development and a plot line. And there's often more affectionate behaviors. Um, so they, in their head, that's what porn is. And therefore, they are less likely to engage with their young people because they don't know porn for what it is now. So young people, particularly, we've, we've got this massive piece of research here, which is amazing. And the young people have said, hey, we don't think this is cool and we're actually struggling with it. But young people, but adults don't know that they're saying that, but also are not bringing it up because they think, oh, you know, all kids do that or boys will be boys or, yeah, we all saw some porn and it was totally fine. Um, so we're trying to trying to bring the youth voice to the adults so that they can have a really good response. I like that. I like that a lot. Why do you think 
it is that there is such a massive gap in communication between caregivers and youths. Yeah, I mean, probably just technology. You know, I think nobody could anticipate the rate at which technology would grow and develop. Um, and so adults, I mean, a lot of the parents I talk to just have no idea what's even available. They don't know exactly how YouTube functions. and They don't know how the, um, you know, if you do a Google search for something, what will come up and how the algorithms work. And so they just actually have, no awareness and that's not their fault so I'm not into parent blaming uh, I'm I want to empower them with the information they they were not to know when they handed their kid a phone you know at 12 or 13 or even you know younger at 10 they were not to know what that meant because they didn't grow up with it right oftentimes adults and kids are using one word pornography to describe two entirely different things um, if we ask previous generations uh, to define pornography, just like you said, oftentimes they think of Playboy. But if you ask kids today, they are being exposed to something very different. No, they might not have ever even seen a Playboy. I mean, Playboy exists now, but they've totally changed their whole platform. So they've, did you know this, that they've created, what, they've created a different style of magazine? And they've they've called it safe, like safe for work. So there's no genitals. I'm not even sure if they show nipples, but they wanted to create something alternative to porn that was much um, milder right. or tamer. And therefore, you <laughs> kind of one of their taglines is that it's safe for work. So you could someone could find it on your laptop and you wouldn't get in trouble. Right. They're almost trying to rebrand it like a lifestyle magazine. Yes, and they've it's been hugely successful. So it's, you know, growth has um, been rapid. And I think that's so interesting and potentially speaks to um, maybe my generation, the millennial generation who who are doing, not the younger, younger millennials, but the older ones like myself, you know, in our 30s. And we're going, hey, this is not that cool and I want something alternative. Um, and I think I think there's some critical thinking there, which is great. Since we're on the topic of Playboy, one stat that I found interesting from your TED Talk was uh, the stat you mentioned around when Playboy peaked. Mm, yeah, so in 19, I think it was 1972, but definitely the 70s. Um, and there, it's, it's kind of hard to ascertain exactly what the viewership was because there's a difference between copies bought off the shelf and subscriptions annually. Um, so, but I believe it was 7 million subscribers a year. And now obviously Pornhub is the only organization at the moment that releases their own data, which is interesting and problematic, but they have 92 million views a day. I think it's important for caregivers to see or to hear in this case, to hear that difference, uh, the difference between the numbers between when Playboy peaked and the viewership on some of the top free tube sites. Mm. I think that understanding that massive change can really help caregivers better understand the new porn landscape as, as you refer to it. Yes, definitely. This, I mean, that's a mind blowing stat and it's, you know, Pornhub now is the second most popular site, so it's actually come down from the first. And so what is that saying about Xvideos, which is the top one? So I'm kind of pivoting here and uh, moving away from the harmful effects of pornography and more uh, sh and shifting towards healthy sexuality, mm -hmm. because it's not very often that we get to chat with a sex therapist. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was, I'm curious to get your take on what is a simple definition of healthy sexuality. Mm. Yeah. So we generally put that under four pillars and off the top of my head, I'll try and remember them, but um, safety. So you need to feel emotionally and physically safe during and after an, a, a sexual experience. So safety, pleasure, so mutual pleasure, not just one person. Uh, emotional connection. Um, and so that doesn't mean, hey, I have to be in 
lots and lots of love, but emotional connection that I, you know, it's, that's that emotional safety component as well. Um, and now I'm forgetting the last one, <laughs> which no, is that's terrible because okay. it's my I, job. I put you on the spot there. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have a, a page actually on our website, which is called Great Sex Versus Porn Sex. Um, and so consent, now I'm, now I'm remembering, consent, emotional connection, pleasure and safety. And so we just have a, a, a little um, kind of resource, I guess, which compares those four pillars in both porn and in real sex and how it would look different. I like that. So the four pillars are consent, safety, mutually pleasurable, and emotional connection. I don't want to sound like we're in court here, but uh, just for the record, do you consider yourself sex positive? Yeah, it's so interesting, the pro-sex um, dialogue. Uh, I I definitely, in that I want people to have really fun, amazing, pleasurable, safe experiences. Um, and I do believe that, you know, what people consent to in their bedrooms is, is totally um, up to them. But I think pro-sex has been slightly misused, um, or I think it can be kind of a tagline to excuse anything um, or give justification to anything. So um, that's kind of a key difference between radical feminism and liberal feminism. Uh, this is getting into kind of the more ideology behind the pro-sex statement. But essentially uh, pro-sex at the moment is being talked about as, oh, no matter what happens at all, um, anything can go as long as the two people are into it. And I would critique that in that, um, you know, what we do in the bedroom uh, is also we play into a political ideology or we also come from constructs. So we come from a Western society particularly is still relatively sexist and women are still experience sexual violence at higher rates or don't feel the same level of empowerment as a man might. And therefore, consent is not necessarily always fully consent if they don't know the paradigm or the construct that they're playing out. So just there's there's always, you know, there's always this power dynamic at play between people. And that can either be totally equal and there can be an equal distribution of power between two people. Um, or there can be kind of this um, power that can play out where it's like, hey, are you okay with me doing this? But because of the society that they're in, one person can still actually hold more power and therefore the woman, for example, might not be fully empowered to do to say whatever she wants. So the words can be, yeah, I consent, but the feelings or the experiences can be, do I have a choice? Okay, yeah. So pro-sex has kind of been thrown around, but I, but I believe there are still things that we need to critique um, under that umbrella. And it seems like you are putting in the work to do that. So thank you for your work. Thank you. As you were talking about the culture and the power dynamics, there was a study that came to mind. Um, it's a study from Australia. So your neighboring country there. <laughs> yes. The participants in this study were ages 15 to 29. And these participants were sent a survey they were presented with a series of questions regarding what types of pornography or what types of behavior they had seen within pornography within the last 12 months. And one thing that stands out from this study is that this study shows that men were portrayed as dominant 70% of the time. So just to kind of echo on what you've already said, this, the fact that kids are turning to pornography to learn about sex is problematic. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, a, there's actually a better piece of research, um, which is actually in New Zealand, but the reason that it's better is because they just look at teenagers. So that's just 14 to 17 year olds. Um, and what we know about research now is that it's quite equivalent across countries. So because of Wi-Fi and data bundles and technology access. So you can see similar things in America or Australia or New Zealand or Sweden or China um, in terms of research outcomes. So 
amongst the 14 to 17 year olds, 72% had seen non-consensual acts. Um, and then 80% had called, had seen a woman being called names or swear words and 90% had actually seen a male controlling or dominating another person. Yeah, thanks for sharing that study. Yeah, that's very concerning. I think that we've got caregivers on board. I think that uh, a portion of them might be hesitant to having these conversations with the kids that they care for. Can you talk to uh, why you think it's important to have healthy conversations about this with kids. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I, I don't want to underestimate how hard that, that can be for parents. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, what can be parent bashing, which is like, why don't you do this? And, and why don't you even think about this? And why aren't you taking control? And, and I just feel a lot of empathy for parents. I'm, I'm, I'm one myself and I know how hard these conversations can be and how awkward we can feel about them. And wanting to do it right, and that can be quite paralyzing. Um, but we we really do need to, and I think at some point we have to decide whether we want to answer our kids' questions or we'll leave it up to Google, uh, because Google will always answer their questions and it will answer it with a video. And so there's kind of a two elements to the conversation. There's the kind of wider sexuality sex sex conversation, and then the porn specific one. Um, I generally say to have that conversation with boys around 10 and then girls around 12. Um, And that's just based on the data because we know that kids are seeing um, porn much earlier than they were in the past. So there's a few things you can do um, just to prepare yourself. The first is to take a deep breath. (laughs) And that sounds a little bit dumb, but it's really important that we come in calm, not come in crazy. uh, Because if we give them a really big reaction, if we you know, if we're really shocked and, you know, we kind of come in hot, uh, telling them what's wrong with it, then they're just going to shut down. Like they're not going to come back for a second conversation. They're going to feel judged. They're going to feel criticized. They're going to feel like you're not a safe person. So come in calm, um, be prepared. Uh, and that means doing some learning, uh, yourself. So getting to know what the new porn landscape is, um, kind of knowing some of the stats, knowing what your key messages are, like what you really want them to get out of that conversation, um, you know, knowing what behaviors they will see online or potentially will see, that will help you not be shocked if they tell you, hey, I, you know, I saw a porn that was like family, like incest sex. Um, so if we go, what? That's crazy. Why would you even look at that? Um, then yeah, they're not coming back. That's the end of that. So coming in really calm, knowing that they could potentially have seen things that you find quite shocking. Uh, So that's doing some of your own learning. And then starting with asking them questions. Um, So not coming in with advice straight away, but asking them what's happening in their peer group. So have your friends ever talked about porn? Have your friends um, ever seen porn? We know that talking about friends is often much easier for them than talking to, to them about them directly. Um, they're much more likely to give you some information uh, and they need to know there's an end point to that conversation. Like you're not just going to drag it out and go for ages. <laughs> um, so those are some kind of, uh, you know, outlying kind of preparing things. Choose the parent also that has the best relationship with them. And that sounds also a little bit weird, but, um, you know, they are more likely to receive and adopt uh, advice if they have a stronger emotional connection with the person. So if they receive information from a teacher that they really dislike, they are less likely to take it on board. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, that does make sense. And for our listeners that aren't aware, we have a tool at ftnd.org forward slash blueprint. It's called Let's Talk About Porn. Yes, I've heard about that. And I think one of the first steps that we mention is to breathe, to take time to take a deep breath. So I think that we're on the same page there, Joe. Yes, that's great. Because it is important to take on these conversations in a calm way. Yes, definitely. Um, That helps them feel just more comfortable. And, And when we introduce... You know, when when we start acting awkward, we actually introduce awkwardness to the conversation. Right. So we can bring that with us rather than it already being present. Like they might actually be fine. 
um, having a conversation. They might not want to talk about their own porn use or everything that they've seen, but they might be okay just having a broader conversation about it. But we can be more awkward than them and that, and that can be a problem. So there are kind of like four things that we really want to get out of a conversation um, from them, four kind of key bits of information. And they're what I call the four C's. So we want to know what their consumption is like. We want to know what they've, we, we want to know how often they might have seen porn, whether it was once, whether it's every day, whether it was, uh, you know, last night, whether it was last year. Um, and that can be hard for them to disclose, but it might happen over a number of conversations. So that will help us understand the impact. So we know that regular use uh, is much more likely to have a negative impact than on, on a young person than someone who's just seen something once. You know, if they just saw something once last month, then they are less, much less likely to be negatively impacted and they'll probably be able to kind of be resi quite resilient to that. Right. Um, so consumption, then we want to know content. And this is the, this is the part that can be the most uncomfortable because we're really asking, hey, what did you see? Um, you know, how many people were in the scene? Uh, what were they touching? What were they doing to each other? You know, and you're wanting to get a sense of if they saw quite aggressive content or really problematic themes. So if they saw, for example, just to be more explicit, if they saw lesbian porn, it's probably going to be kind of <laughs> tame and playful and fun. It's going to be explicit and then it's nudity, but they're probably not going to be hitting each other or calling each other bitches, you know, just as an example. So if they saw something like that, it's also probably going to have less of an impact on them. But if they saw violent, aggressive sex or racially charged sex um, or group sex, for example, then that is going to have a bigger impact. So we content is actually really important. Um, and then we want to know context. So we're into our third C. And the most crucial thing there is safety. So did an adult show them porn? because that is illegal, at least here, and it probably is there too. Um, and so we want to know that they're safe. We want to know that they're safe at school, that they're safe at friends' houses, and we want to know that they're in safe relationships, um, you know, safe romantic relationships. So are they experiencing a lot of pressure to watch porn? And therefore, we need to talk to them about pressure, not just porn. So context is really important, and, and particularly around the adult um, distribution. And then the last and then the last thing is just what is the the outcome, the cause, the consequence been? And I don't mean like a neg I don't mean you know what are the consequences for you in coming in hot like around punishment, but what are actually what are the what are the things they're feeling like? What are their concerns? Um, what's going on inside of them? And so were they really confused by what they saw? Were they potentially traumatized by what they saw? And we know that if a young person has had a sexual abuse history, that they are more likely to be triggered and traumatized from what they've seen. Um, so were they turned on, but they also found it really disturbing and therefore they feel shame. You know, so how, uh, how is it impacting them emotionally, but then how is it impacting their relationships? Has somebody asked them to do something they don't feel comfortable with, for example? So those are the four areas, um, consumption, uh, context, content, and um, concerns. I love that. I, I love all the content that you uh, put out. The four C's. Yeah. <laughs> they're easy to remember. They're uh, very insightful. Yeah. My, my, my prefacing two C's are calm, not crazy. Calm, not <laughs> crazy. Yeah. That's a good approach. And that is not always easy. I am a parent. Uh, and so, yeah, I can, I can uh, testify to that, that that is not always the easiest thing to do. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I understand. Kind of shifting gears here. Do you find that it's uncommon to have sex therapists that also talk to the harmful effects of pornography? Yes. <laughs> so there aren't very many sex therapists who want to come out really um, on any issue and give some kind of what they might feel is a judgment call. Um, and that's because as therapists, you know, we have very strongly trained into being non-judgmental non and having what we call unconditional positive regard, which is always viewing our clients in a really positive way um, and not necessarily condemning particular behaviors, but trying to hear their experiences and then um, 
you know, navigate them towards a healthier pathway. So it's kind of in, so deeply ingrained into us not to come out too strong on issues. Um, but I come from a sex education background where I was a sex education provider and I was also a youth and child um, trauma and abuse counsellor. So I feel like I kind of have these other experiences which I cannot avoid um, and just come from a place of deep, deep concern. Uh, and I, I can't kind of squash my voice. <laughs> Sometimes that would be helpful, but it's I just can't help myself. Well, life would be easier in yeah, some ways. Totally. <laughs> yeah, a lot of sex therapists also hold what they would call, um, you know, a really that, that sex, um, sex positive view that we were talking about before, where all behaviors can kind of be justified. Right. I know you mainly speak to youth, but... Another question I have is regarding couple intimacy and relationship harmony. And I want to quote uh, Julie and John Gottman, Dr. Julie and John Gottman from the Gottman Institute. They are some of the leading experts when it comes to healthy relationships. And I want to I want to take a quote from them. It says, We are led to unconditionally conclude that for many reasons pornography poses a serious threat to couple intimacy and relationship harmony. Mm. Can you talk to this quote um, regarding relationship harmony and couple intimacy and how pornography can disrupt those? Yeah, I mean, it's fair to say that the people who come into my therapeutic space are already struggling so so uh it's going to be slightly biased in that i'm only hearing negative outcomes does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah yeah so i'm only hearing really from people who are who are, for whom this has become an issue for them um and other therapists you know would could probably say differently um but yeah i mean the impacts that i see are so significant um particularly just around betrayal uh, where there's been secrets held, um, promises not kept, uh, where there's been disclosures around what kind of content they've um, been watching that their partner didn't know about. Um, yeah, at the, at the use of another stimulus for arousal other than the partner they've got in real life. Um, the betrayal can be so huge uh, and devastating to a, a marriage or a long-term relationship. Um, but also nuanced impacts like, um, you know, struggling with struggling with arousal, having different expectations of sex. Um, so tr wanting to try out behaviors your partner's not comfortable with. Um, yeah, so there can be some of those other other um, other impacts. Um, you only need to look at wider social learning th theory. Um, you know, we can we we talk very freely and openly, and um, we admit that we are um, conditioned through life on all other areas. But for some reason, people are more uncomfortable saying that about porn. Um, so we, you know, for example, we know that advertising impacts uh, us. We know that um, billboards impact us. We know that TV shows impact us. We know that our parents impact us. We know that our education impacts us. And we're kind of really comfortable and okay with saying all of those things. But for some reason, when it comes to porn, people kind of clam up and go, oh, I don't know, uh, or I'm not convinced. Um, and if you're not convinced or you don't know in that space, then you should throw it all into question as well. Right. I have a six-year-old boy. So do I. Oh, do you? <laughs> yes. Nice. So you can relate to this too, since you have a six-year-old. My thought is that someone who says that video can't influence behavior hasn't seen a six-year-old after watching Spider-Man. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> so true. Yes, exactly. Um, I once actually heard a another sex therapist talk about how um, porn doesn't uh, impact us significantly and we can take example from Spider-Man because he said, you know, we can watch Spider-Man and we don't all think that we can like fly across buildings and climb walls. Um, and so he was, you know, kind of uh, pulling down that argument right. uh, about porn impacting us. And it was so interesting because I thought, well, no, one, yes, because kids do believe that they can be Spider-Man, you know, exactly what you've said. But also, um, but also we, it's kind of known and amongst adults that of course we can't do that. But when we see porn, we know we can do those things. 
So if we see someone in porn slap someone and pull their hair, we know that actually that is something we can try. Whereas with Spider-Man, we know we can't try and jump off a building. So they are just so different. Right. Funny story. My cousin, he, when he was really young, you know, around the age of five or so, he actually wanted to get bit by a spider so wow. that he could become Spider-Man. He thought that was a thing. <laughs> Is just someone talk to him about that? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, funny story, and it kind of aligns with what we're talking about here. Another thing that I wanted to mention that relates to what we're talking about right now is from your TED Talk, you said that sometimes a, a proponent of pornography might say that one of the benefits of pornography is that it is educational yes. when it comes to you know helping someone develop in their sexuality. Yes. So the proponent of this, in, in this particular example, a proponent of pornography might say that it's educational, and your answer is yes, but yes. what is it teaching? Yeah, and I mean, I don't want to totally um, diminish some people's positive experiences, and I'll give you an example. So we know that the LGBT community don't get really robust sex education, or they feel um, stigmatized in wider communities, you know, so we know that um, from, you know, extensive research and you only need to hear personal accounts to know that that's true. So we know that for a lot of the LGBT community, they see porn and it's been really affirming and that they look at that and they go, hey, this is the first time I've ever seen two people hold hands or this is the first time I've ever seen two, two people of the same gender Piss. And that can be this incredibly normalizing, empowering, almost, you know, also liberating experience. And so I'm not trying to take away from that, but that's kind of at first glimpse. And then when you when you look more at the porn in those genres and in other genres, mainstream genres, um, you know, the education goes much deeper and much wider. Um, so the first experience can be quite normalizing and empowering, but, you know, the fifth one will will probably start to shape your mind and your expectations and that will largely be around aggressive sex. The fact that people are searching for it is really problematic, but the fact that kids can see it without even wanting to is even more problematic. <laughs> right. Well, Joe, as we begin to uh, wrap up the, the conversation, I just need to ask, is there anything stirring inside that you want to share that we haven't touched on yet? Probably the one thing that parents ask a lot about is filtering. So a lot of parents say to me, um, you know, it, it, will it be okay if I put a filter on the Wi-Fi or put a filter on their device? Um, so classic. I don't know. What are the most popular filtering services in America? One of our favorites is Bark. Okay. They offer an accountability software as well as a filtration software. Oh, yes. So interesting. I can't wait to see what happens there. Yeah, they're great. Um, yeah, and they're only available in the US and they need to be available in New Zealand. <laughs> um, yeah, they're going to be, that's going to be phenomenal. But um, yeah, so parents, I think, quite heavily can, can easily and quite heavily rely on filtering services. And I'm not saying don't do that. I think it's definitely good as a delay mechanism. So it's really good for our, for our little ones and really up to about 13, 14. But we know that um, around that age, they either start to get around it or they're outside of your house so much that it is not necessarily the best tool for them. So filtering, good. Delay mechanism, good. But the conversation is going to be the thing that really helps them long term. Uh, so don't just, you know, kind of throw a filter on your device and then just hands off uh, because it's one, you know, all of them are fallible. But also they leave your house like they walk out the front door and they go to someone else's house and they go to school and they're going to sit in a classroom and someone might show them porn in, in the classroom, in the corridor, at McDonald's, at Starbucks, you know. They're not in your home anymore, um, and therefore it's your the conversations with you as the parent that are really going to arm them with the tools so so that it doesn't have as much of an impact. I love that. That falls in line with our mission statement when it comes to education. Yeah, filtration can be a great mechanism, like you said, uh, but education is critical. For some of our listeners that are a little bit more hesitant to have those 
uh, meaningful and healthy conversations with the kids that they care for. What is your advice for them in regards to when to have the conversation and, mm. and how frequently should they have this conversation? Yeah, so, I mean, you, often parents are the experts on their own children, so it can be hard for professionals to weigh in too much. Um, you know, if you know that your um, young person is having relationships uh, or that their friends are having romantic or sexual relationships, um, then you want to have conversations more regularly but I mean I would probably bring something up once a month um, I would probably ask a broad question and then give a specific kind of response so I'd say something like um, has you know have any of your teachers started talking about peer pressure or have any of your um, friends started um, talking about contraception or with something very broad um, that's opening up a conversation and they could be like gross no or they could say shut up I don't want to talk to you <laughs> or they could just try and shut that down really fast and that is totally fine um you know we don't need to come in come in hot to that and tell them off straight away because what they're really doing is just saying I'm uncomfortable but at that point you don't just back off um but you say something you input a little piece of advice just a couple of sentences like oh I heard this thing that said um you know lots of young people are using porn as a sex educator and uh, I think there's lots of porn might be quite aggressive and so that could be a problem uh, and see what they say if they say nothing that's cool then just just pull back and go in again in a month's time you know so we go big broad question and then we throw in a little sentence um and they might give you nothing in return they might not even look at you give you eye contact they might tell you to shut up again uh and that's just don't worry about that. They might want to talk to you, but they just might not know how. You know, I remember being desperate to have conversations with my parents, but I was just too uncomfortable and I just didn't know how to bring it up and it just felt too weird. But what they did, which I appreciated, is that they just kept throwing little tidbits out. It's like throwing a breadcrumb out and you they do eat it. You know, they will pick it up and they will nibble on that. Um, but just throw them out every once in a while and that will land. I love that. Well, Joe... I'm sitting here with a smile on my face because this has been a fun conversation and uh, you're a good person. Oh. We appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. It's a privilege. Talking about porn can be tricky. That's why we created an interactive conversation guide called Let's Talk About Porn. Simply select who you'd like to talk to, your partner, child, friends, parents, or even a stranger and select the type of conversation you'd like to have. We'll walk you through a healthy way to approach this taboo topic in a productive conversation. Let's Talk About Porn is available for free, both in English and Spanish, so you can be prepared to talk when someone asks why you're listening to a podcast about the harms of porn. Access the guide and start talking at ftnd.org forward slash blueprint. That's ftnd.org forward slash blueprint. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science facts and personal accounts. If you want to learn more about today's guest and the conversation we had, you can check out the links included with this episode. Again, big thanks to you for listening to this conversation. As you go about your day, we invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.